I have the privilege uh, of introducing in a few minutes our distinguished keynote speaker, Dr. Thomas Cole, a pioneering thinker about the assets and also the constraints that shape whether we will age successfully. And part of his prolific literary output is a book Dr. Cole co-authored titled A Guide to Humanistic Studies in Aging. What does it mean to grow old? I cite this work because it explores, among other questions, what is our moral obligation to care for elderly persons and why our friendships of special importance to older people. These are subjects that are at the heart of our work at AARP Foundation. AARP Foundation helps vulnerable older adults surmount the challenges they face so that they can lead long, healthier, and fulfilling lives. Working closely across all sectors, we help to create the tangible foundation for a life of continuing purpose and opportunity. The paramount question we all face in this context, as scientists and leaders across many disciplines, as leaders in the field of aging, as government officials, as neighbors, is this. What must we do together so that longer lives are, in fact, better lives, financially secure and socially connected? We help older adults who are struggling achieve and sustain financial security, independence, and the social connections we all need. We pull senior poverty out of the shadows and tackle it, as Dave said, with evidence-based solutions. It's, it's often, we often forget, and it can sometimes unfortunately be too easy to forget that the faces of senior poverty often aren't who we think. More than 10 million adults over 50 in the United States live in poverty, and all told, more than 37 million are either already living in poverty or just one life event from slipping into it. And we know that all over this nation, all over our country, including in Boston, right here, there are people working full time and working hard, and they are struggling to take care of their families and to meet their basic needs. They need jobs with family-sustaining wages. We help the vulnerable 50-plus population age in place. The ability to remain independent, to remain a valued member of community is something we all desire. When people are able to age in place, to live in place, it makes, as we know, a defining difference in their lives, but also in the life of community. Because when we subtract the many contributions of older persons, we all lose. Aging in place, living in place then, is an individual and also a societal priority. So in support of aging in place, at AARP Foundation, we're working closely with the public, private, nonprofit sectors on a new project titled Home for Life. Together, we're in the very initial stages of designing a predictive tool, a tool to better identify the correlation between the various factors that promote the ability to continue to live independently for as long as an older adult chooses. And I invite you to get on the ground floor, as you will, in this project. We need your ideas and involvement, so if you're interested, please reach out to me and my team. As we work to end senior poverty and promote independence, we're also addressing the silent epidemic of social isolation. And GSA is a terrific founding partner in this work. CEO James Appleby, as you heard, serves as a critically important member of the Executive Council, thank you James, of Connect to Effect, the coalition we've constructed to address social isolation, and I want to pause and honor and recognize Greg's incredible work in championing Connect to Effect. The key here, of course, is connection, which is a kind of preventive medicine, and we call it preventive connection. 
An AARP Foundation national survey on loneliness and social isolation finds that older adults who have low income are especially vulnerable. Nearly half of midlife and older adults with annual incomes of less than $25,000 report being lonely, and one in five are isolated. Low-income adults from underrepresented communities, people of color, LGBTQ plus individuals, immigrants, refugees, those living in rural areas face additional barriers that contribute to social isolation, as do unpaid caregivers. Prolonged isolation puts millions of older adults at risk of diminished health. It can be worse for our health than obesity, and for older adults, the health risks of prolonged isolation have been found to be equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Social isolation is also expensive. A recent study by AARP's Public Policy Institute found that social isolation increases Medicare spending by almost $7 billion annually. Connection, on the other hand, is good. It's great for our health. It is the catalyst for re-energizing the purpose-driven life. So as we work to increase economic opportunity and social connections, we see low-income seniors as an asset to our communities, not a problem to be solved. Using human-centered design as our guide, we work to understand the needs of low-income seniors from their perspective. And that's one reason that Dr. Cole's in-depth portrayals of older adults are so vital. The purpose-driven life shouldn't be just the province of the privileged. The GSA has an indispensable role to play as they support inclusion and a view that encompasses older adults, older adults of all identities and in every neighborhood. Because with stronger financial and social supports, we know that vulnerable seniors can live the kind of purposeful lives in their later years that everyone wants and everyone deserves. To put those social supports in place, we need to identify and encourage what I've come to call purpose matchmakers. People who connect isolated seniors with opportunities for engagement in their community. In many cases, those lives will be enriched by meaningful interaction across generations. Those intergenerational connections can help each of us find a life-affirming, life-spanning rhythm of reappraisal and of recharging. Pursuing the purposes of longer lives doesn't take us down, as we know, a prescribed path. It enables us, however, to open doors that unlock new possibilities new opportunities, and find new passions beyond what we envision today. Our keynote speaker is a thoughtful guide to those possibilities and those passions. Dr. Thomas Cole is a deeply accomplished thinker and writer, well known for shedding light on some of the most challenging questions in aging. Dr. Cole's career is highly decorated, highly distinguished, and unusually wide-ranging. He is an author, an historian, filmmaker, and gerontologist. He is the McGovern Chair in Medical Humanities and Director of the McGovern Center for Humanities and Ethics at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. And his many books and articles on aging and gerontology include The Journey of Life, which was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. He has produced award-winning films, such as The Strange Demise of Jim Crow, Still Life, The Humanity of Anatomy, which looks at the relationship between medical students and the people who donate their bodies, and a look at the world of stroke survivors living with stroke. His current project, which we will hear about, A Country of Old Men, examines the lives, ideas, and identities of contemporary male elders. We are in for a treat today. Please join me in a warm welcome for Dr. Thomas Cole.
Morning. Thank you for showing up. A couple of years ago, as I was walking into the GSA convention in New Orleans, I ran into Dave Eckert in the library. He was just moving into the position of president-elect, considering possible themes for the conference. What do you think the purposes of longer lives are, he said. Love, I answered. Love is the most important one. I said that without thinking. He cocked his head with a quizzical look, and we both had places to go, and we never talked about it again. The next year, a colleague of mine in geriatrics gave grand rounds on trends in health and longevity. After the talk, I raised my hand and said, yes, but what do we want to be healthy for? He gave me that same quizzical look. What is the quizzical look? I think it is one of recognition and puzzlement. People recognize that the stories, that these questions cut to the heart of being human, and they are puzzled because when the questions are raised in gerontology, they don't get any traction using the methods of, of science. Rather than numbers alone, we need the tools of the humanities and interpretive social sciences. We need ethics. We need stories. To put this another way, we need to number our days, not only by counting them, but also by taking stock of them. Teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. There it is. I thought it was going to come up. Of course, this is from Psalm 90. Um, in secular terms, it's said that Einstein kept a sign in his office that read, not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. So what are the purposes of growing old or longevity? Why do we want to be healthy? Because we rarely raise these questions, our understanding and approach to aging is limited, and it lacks existential richness. I want to show you how this came to be historically, using a long iconographic tradition of representing human lifetime in Western cultures. Symbols and images give us unique access to widely held values and beliefs. They reflect anxieties and aspirations. And when they change, we learn something else about anxieties and aspirations, something new. So in the talk, I want to do three things. First, I want you to think visually. I want you to, you to see the long historical transition from medieval to modern, from the religious understanding of aging as a mysterious part of the eternal order of things to the secular scientific understanding of aging as a problem to be solved. Second, I want to look at the tension between science and religion or between problems and mysteries and how it appears in the field of gerontology. In particular, we'll look at medical decision making uh, and in narrative gerontology or stories. And third, we'll look at a few key figures in the emergence of humanistic gerontology and the role of stories in helping us number our days. Along the way, I'll share some stories of my own with you. Take a look at these life cycle images. I don't want you to worry too much about the details. Just look and let me help you absorb the basic worldviews, meanings, and values. There are three visual symbols that will stand out. The life cycle as a circle, as here. The life cycle as a rising and falling staircase. And finally, the hourglass as a symbol of time. Take a look at this image. It's reproduced from an 11th century monk's manual stored in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. It seems strange, right? Strange, incomprehensible at first, especially since it's written in Greek and Latin. The image is essentially a cosmic compass. It's a diagram of the universe that was meant to help monks understand themselves by meditating on their place in God's creation and in the cycle of life. What do you notice about it? First. The universe is shaped like a circle. Right? It's a spinning circle that rotates around God at the center. Deus is the Latin word for God. 
Take a look at the four spokes of the wheel. The horizontal spokes represent the spring and the autumnal equinoxes, the days of the year in which daytime and nighttime are of equal length. The vertical spokes, these are the summer and winter solstices, the longest and shortest days of the year. For our purposes, the key circle is the one that links the stages of life with the four seasons of year of the year. I won't go through the Latin, but in the lower left, you see ver and pueritia, which means that uh, spring is linked to childhood. In the upper left, adolescence is the summer of life. Upper right, manhood is the autumn of life. And old age is the winter of life on the lower right. Again, all stages of your life make sense because they exist within a divinely created eternal universe. Everything is linked to everything else. This may seem like a primitive and a strange image to you, but it is, act, exact, it is actually a very sophisticated cosmic compass for its own time. And I haven't even gone in to the images of the months of the year, the zodiac, the geographical descriptions. I mean, it's really quite an amazing thing. And the idea was that monks, right, it was a very illiterate culture, but monks would meditate on this to try to find out who they were in relationship to the whole. This image is a Christ-centered wheel of life. Uh, it's an illuminated manuscript from the 14th century. Um, now it's housed in the British Museum. It was owned by an aristocrat, and like the preceding image, it was meant as an aid to prayer and meditation. It portrays the human life cycle again as a circle, painted in bright colors with detailed illustrations and Latin descriptions of the four stages of life, which branch out into ten medallions. It conveys a calm orderliness of life renewing itself. It's an urban image. Of course, this was probably a French aristocrat's castle, right? not exactly um, the ordinary person. But the idea is it was a circle, and life made sense um, because it was a God-centered universe. And here we see at the center an image of Christ. I rule all with equal reason. These are the Latin words that are in a small circle around Christ's head. The clear, clear implication is that all stages of life are equally valuable in God's eyes, that no stage of life is closer or farther away than any other. And this is an idea, this equality of the meaning and value of every stage of life that gets lost uh, in the future, and we'll see how that happens. So take a look at the four corners of the image. In the lower left, you'll see a youth. I mean, I'm sorry, you'll see a child in the lower left corner. In the upper left, you'll see um, an adolescent, a youth. In the upper right, an aging man, and an old man in the lower right, described as decrepit. But here again, we see the life cycle imagined as a circle, and the circle implies eternal life. As T.S. Eliot put it in the four quartets, in my beginning is my end. This image is uh, from a 15th century woodcut from Augsburg. <clears throat> the woodcut is printed on a broadsheet and produced for an urban and a more popular audience. It's the kind of thing that you would see sold today on the streets of New York or Prague or Paris where a vendor is basically selling his wares, his sketches, his cartoons to people going by. The image combines the seven ages of man with the wheel of fortune. A soldier spinning around on the top with his spear could strike at any age, suggesting the uncertainty of life, of course. So look at the seven, seven stages of a male's life. A baby in a cradle, lower left, swaddled. A toddler with his pinwheel. At 10 o'clock, uh, we see uh, a man learning to hunt with a falcon. Then an older, older man counting his money, like many of us who are getting ready for retirement. Finally, we see an older man on a cane, 
and then a corpse waiting for burial and judgment. The image is still circular, but it does take an angel to hold the beginning and the end of life together. <clears throat> this, is an, this is a 16th century image by Cornelius Tunison from Amsterdam that I found in the Rijksmuseum. It's probably my favorite image of all of these. I'm sorry, I have strange tastes. <laughs> Actually, I brought home a print from, from the Rijksmuseum, and I had it printed on a T-shirt that I gave to my boss, Ron Carson, when he turned 50. I don't think he was actually very pleased. <clears throat> but look at the elements of the engraving. It's still set in the natural world, indicated by the sunburst in the morning of life on the upper left and the dark evening of life on the upper right. The skeleton, whose name is Time or Tempus, is reminding the middle-aged man in a Roman toga that we are born to die. In the center is a book open to the words in Latin, I have knowledge of God and natural reason, reminding a Renaissance audience that religious belief and natural philosophy are intertwined, or in our case, in our language, that faith and reason, faith and science complement each other. And today, of course, too, too often we operate in separate silos. Take a look at the, this is a close-up, close take a look at the man pointing the child towards a very large hourglass, beneath which are the words, the speed of time, velocitas tempora. The hourglass as a way of measuring time emerged in the 8th century, but it later emerged as a symbol um, to, to symbolize the amount of time available to each individual. Look at the size of the hourglass. It's almost as big as the child. The size of the hourglass com com conveys its importance. The message to you, the viewer, is there's a limited amount of time in your hourglass. How are you going to spend it? An answer arose to that question in the 17th century in Europe. And it was basically, act like this. Live a life of order, monogamy, hard work, virtue, and you will be rewarded with health, success, long life in this world, and salvation in the next. Take a look at the staircase. It rises from the left to the center to age 50 and declines steadily to death at age 100. These people aspired to live to 100 years old. And this at a time when average life expectancy at birth <clears throat> was the mid to late 30s. People died of infectious disease, poor nutrition, violence, and childbirth. So we are not the only ones to aspire to a long and healthy life. In fact, the dream of health and longevity was born 350 years ago and it was finally recognized, realized in the 20th century, albeit with some glitches. And this is basically the idea of the classic sociologist, Max Weber's idea of the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. Hard work makes success, makes longevity, and in this case, makes salvation. So today, we're, <clears throat> we're all familiar with the idea of the life course. And we've created institutions and passages and programs which unfortunately are now under attack, but our institutions are based on age or stage of life. But it wasn't always so. These are acts of artistic imagination. This is a historically new image and vision of human life. The life cycle is no longer imagined as a circle that repeats itself. Instead, it's a rising and a falling staircase that becomes a new cognitive map. Life is a career. Life is a course of life, complete with the rules of behavior and of ideals for every stage of life. Let's look at how the image helps people imagine an ideal course of life. The title in the, at the top of the banner literally means steps of old age, but for our purposes can be translated as stages of life. This newly imagined urban life course is still tied to nature. 
If you look at the springtime of life on the left, conveyed by the new leaves on the young tree, and the winter of life, of life conveyed on the right by an old broken leafless tree with an owl perched on its lone, lone branch. Take a look under the arch. <clears throat> under the arch is a scene of Christ coming to separate the saved from the damned. It is essentially a window onto eternity, a way of representing the connection between this life and the next. The core idea, again, is that hard work gives you the best chance for salvation in the next world and success and long life in this world. Towards the bottom, you see a, a child with toys and an hourglass, and on the right, you see a skeleton holding the arrow of death in one hand and an hourglass in the next. This is a British version of essentially the same image. It's not the same quality. But on the bottom of this, it's clearly copied from the Dutch original, or what I wanted you to see, which is teach us to number our days that we may apply for hearts of wisdom. After its original appearance in Northern Europe, this rising and falling staircase became standardized and circulate throughout Western Europe for the next 350 years. First, it hung in aspiring homes of city dwellers, and then it came to be printed on Spanish cigarette wrappers, on German beer mugs, on American lithographs. It functioned at a poster. The Grimm brothers, Jacob and Wilhelm, who wrote Grimm's fairy tales, remembered that it hung on the wall in their parents' home when they were growing up. This image is an 18th century image, same shape, same basic idea, same desired lifespan. It's punctuated by life cycle events and stripped of any reference to nature or images of God or the second coming. Really, it's drab and uninteresting, um, but it still say, serves the same purpose of trying to acculturate people to this aspiration of a long and orderly life. Uh, we take this for granted but it was not something to be taken for granted. This had to be created, this idea that it was possible to live a long life if you acted according to certain rules. This is a 19th century French version, De Grèce des Anges. It was printed from the workshop of a man named Pellerin, who printed playing cards and other prints for a mass audience, likely a Catholic audience. If you go on Google, you can find at least 10 versions of this image from the same time period. In this image, you see more clearly the ageism built into the whole tradition. The descriptions on the right side of the staircase are the French words for decline, decay, weakness, and decrepitude. <clears throat> Here we see an American lithograph, probably from Courier and Ives. Of course, you'll see in it the traditional gender roles on the left and on the right of men as caregivers. And it also includes uh, an animal representing every stage of life. But I think it's important to mention, despite the, the in traditional gender roles, that each of these images has an image of caregiving at the end of life. There's no sense um, that people are walking away alone, that they're facing their death alone. They are always accompanied. Um, here you see the female American version of the stages or ages of life, printed in 1826. Interestingly, the peak of a woman's life is at age 30, perhaps the end of childbearing age. The traditional elements are there, a morning of life conveyed by the rising sun on the lower left, and the evening of life conveyed by a starry moonlit night on the lower right. The woman still lives to 90. Remember, this is an amazing aspiration given how long people were actually living. The hourglass is full, at the beginning of life on the left, and it's empty on the, at the end of life on the right. So by the end of the 19th century, this imagery, this whole tradition had become stale and rigid and trite and moralistic. You might have felt that it was that way the whole time. But for its population, that's how it began to feel. It no longer functioned as a viable way of helping people imagine their lives and it disappeared among the rise of industry, migration, secularization, and the development of modern scientific and medical knowledge. Who among us would go back to a moralistic Christian vision of human lifetime that by definition excluded many of us um, and became untenable 
or with the rise of modern science. But my point is that as this tradition disappeared, we lost something. We lost a, a cultural image, a cultural way of imagining meanings and values and purposes. We lost a cosmic compass. We lost a sense of cosmic um, comfort of being in the world. Um, that's one of the reasons why Dave Eckert has to ask the question, what are the purposes uh, of longer lives? <clears throat> I did find one major exception to the disappearance of the stages of life imagery. It's a unique painting created by the hugely talented and hugely troubled French artist Paul Gauguin. Gauguin moved to Tahiti in uh, 1897 where he married and lived until he died until 1903. Take a look at the image. Do you recognize anything about it? Read it from right to left. And I think you'll see that it represents the arc of a woman's life placed in a natural Polynesian setting. On the right-hand side is a young baby with three maternal figures nearby. In the center is a tall Eve-like figure perhaps gathering fruit forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. On the lower left is an old woman nearing death, accompanied again by a younger woman. And in the background is an idol, what Gauguin called the beyond, perhaps the next world, some kind of inkling of a life beyond this one. I think this is an amazing image. Um, it hangs in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. If you are brave enough to comfort, to uh, brave the cold, I would suggest you go out and take a look at it if you have time. So here's a close-up uh, of the upper left. Um, the French words are duvenant nu, cousin nu, ouelant nu. Where do we come from? Who are, where, who are we? And where are we going? These are our questions. Right? These are our perennial questions. So in 1897, Juan Gauguin drew this painting he was suicidal, he had syphilis, he was poor, and he poured everything into this image, his largest, and he thought it was his best. But here, he's again, he's using the life cycle to, per, to pose our perennial questions. Where do we come from? What are we? And where are we going? This you might not recognize, <clears throat> unless you're about as old as I am. Uh, it's the eight stages of life. It's a diagram um, taken from Eric Erickson's classic book, Childhood and Society. Um, it's a diagram of the eight stages of life, each with their psychosocial tasks. Um, and as you can see, it moves diagonally onward and upward from the lower left to the upper right, the eighth, sta eighth stage, um, which represents the psychosocial task of integrity, e ego integrity, versus despair. In this illustration, at the apex, there is nowhere to go. Right? It's like you fall off a cliff. And a few years later, Erickson wrote, our, our world is, is a one-way street to never-ending progress, and our lives are to be a one-way street to success and oblivion. In other words, what happens in the next path? What, what are the purposes? What do we do in here? Why does it matter, right? <clears throat> Do any of you remember Saul Steinberg, the New Yorker cartoonist? This is his answer to that, right? This is the, you know, retirement is oblivion. <laughs> it's a demotion. It's a false, empty form of leisure. So what's happening here is that Steinberg is recalling this earlier motif, the stages of life motif, in order to make fun of it, right? Because it's long since dead as anything vi culturally viable, but it's there to make fun of. Um, and he does it, I think, very well. <clears throat> and here you see uh, the female version that Steinberg gave us. Um, in this case, the peak of a woman's life is earlier. It's a culture referring to that in which a wo woman's value is tied to her beauty. So you can see 40 is the top of the stairs, and then you have a gradual but steady decline. Many of you know the work of Margaret Goulet, who's the most trenchant 
tireless, wide-ranging warrior in the cultural fight against ageism. And I think what you see in this imagery, this long stages of life imagery, is part of the cultural basis for ageism. It shows us how embedded ages is in our culture. But Margaret has consistently called our attention to this as our primary cultural story of the second half of life, which she calls the decline narrative. So the Steinberg cartoons, mocking though they are, remind us that the narrative of decline is deeply embedded in the rising and falling staircase. For centuries, the most popular image of the life course in the West. Margaret cont contends in many of her books that much of we dr what we dread about aging is actually the result of ageism. And our enemy is ageism, not aging. And most of us are walking targets for products and experts, of course, that help us, that promise to help us conquer aging. This is an image that really doesn't need any interpretation. <clears throat> In the early 1980s, I came across this picture. It was scotch taped on the wall of my father-in-law's shoe store in Omaha, Nebraska. It's a picture that half advertises and half, make, half makes fun of the exercise craze and the desire for ageless bodies. The only thing missing is cosmetic surgery or Botox. The weeping willow tree in the background is a symbol of immortality. If you have the right exercise regime, you will live forever. So now I want to turn back to the hourglass, whose symbolism we've seen before. And it's used here again in 1983 on the cover of the President's Commission volume on uh, decisions to uh, withdraw or forgo life-sustaining treatment. So even though we were promised that our regimes of exercise would keep us immortal, people actually did die. And in the 1980s, more of us, more of them, were dying in intensive care units. So this volume dedicated to the ethics of decision to forgo life-sustaining treatment um, picked up the imagery of the hourglass, which I found fascinating. So it's still an image of the uh, limited amount of time uh, in each individual's life. But the first time I saw the image, I was at a conference sitting next to the geriatrician Joanne Lynn. I asked her what she thought. I'd like to draw a new picture with a physician cutting a hole in the top and putting more sand in, she said. So beginning in the 1980s, 70s, and then 80s, there was increasing concern that for some patients who were dying, the new technology of life-sustaining equipment was prolonging suffering rather than extending meaningful life. Unprecedented ethical questions about withdrawing or withholding treatment emerged and fostered the development of a whole new field of bioethics, which is why I have a job. The sand mark in the hourglass reflects not only how long a person would live now, but also how wise it was to keep a person alive, at what expense, with what quality of life, and who would survive, I mean, who would decide. In the last few decades, controlling the manner and timing of our death has become more and more possible and more and more no uh, normative. But decisions are still assumed to be the province of the individual and his or her proxy and healthcare team. This is a picture of Dan Callahan, the founder of the Hastings Center, uh, the first and probably still the most prestigious bioethics think tank in the country. He was the first person who challenged this individual approach to decision making at the end of life. Callahan has spent much of his life asking difficult questions. What are the meanings and purposes of old age? What is a reasonably but not excessively long life? What is a tolerable death? And how much should society spend on expensive measures to prolong the life of older people? In his book, Setting Limits, Medical Goals in an Aging Society, published in 1987, Callahan argues that after we have lived a natural lifespan, which he thought was 70 to 80, I don't think any of us would think that anymore, but after we've lived what he called a natural lifespan, society should limit expensive life-extending medical procedures for otherwise dying patients. 
The goals of treatment should be care rather than cure. And society should use its resources to promote a more just society rather than extend individual lives. Callahan's book enraged many people who claimed it was ageist and that it would lead to rationing. And rationing, of course, is the political kiss of death in American economic policy. But controversy is good for book sales. The book sold almost 80,000 copies when it came out, and it was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. By the way, the Hastings Center has just released a new special issue on this topic, What Makes a Good Life in Late Life, um, very much worth taking a look at. And Callahan himself gets the last word in this um, uh, offering. So when I first met Callahan in the 1980s, he gave me a copy of another book of his called The Tyranny of Survival, and he inscribed it to me for Tom Cole, a kindred spirit. In 2014, when I went to interview him for the first time of two times for this book I was working on, he was 84 years old, and he was living his own questions. He had recently undergone an $80,000 treatment for a heart condition. He was suffering from multiple and crippling diseases. After 47 books and over 450 articles, he no longer had the energy or the desire to write. If I don't write, he said to me, what do I do with the rest of my life? That's the question, right? That's the question. How can gerontology help answer those questions? And from my point of view, what are the roles of humanities and arts and interpretive social science in helping us think about those questions. <clears throat> this is the branding image of the 40th anniversary meeting of the GSA held in New Orleans in 1985. Uh, I hope you'll recognize the hourglasses. Right? On the left is the original hourglass chosen as the logo in 1945. And on the right is a more modernized image of the hourglass um, and by that time, it's a symbol of a symbol, right? It's this kind of strange modernization, um, which actually still exists today. I got a pin of the, of the logo hourglass today, and we'll, we'll take a good look at it. So I'm not sure who chose the hourglass originally or what they were thinking. And I doubt many of you have thought much about its meaning either, if you've even noticed it at all, right? After all, it's a branding tool, right? But it's a very important branding tool. So historically, as we've seen, it represents the limited amount of time available to each individual. So what I'm asking you to do is think about the meaning of the limited amount of time, right? Numbering our days and taking stock of them, right? To become wise? What's wisdom? I don't think we know. So I've used this slide to help remind us of the continuity of the hourglass as the GSA logo and to remind us of the historical continuity and significance of the image in, in general. But for now, I want to emphasize that the hourglass is empty. The upper, upper glass and the lower glass are empty. So for a minute, I want you to open yourself to its history and its possible meanings. I want you to focus on its emptiness for a minute. That's a strange idea, but focus on its emptiness. And let the empty hourglass, just for a second, hold my own thoughts about humanistic gerontology, about its birth and its presence in gerontology as a whole, and about how questions of meaning and purposes can be poured into the sands of a lifetime, about how when we number our days, we not only count them, but we take stock of them. I remember attending that 1985 conference. I remember talking to Rachel uh, Pruthnow today about that conference. I said, how old were you? She said, I wasn't born yet. <laughs> it was so cool. It was very cool. <clears throat> so I was 36, and I was very new to gerontology. And at a break, I walked with my elders, Bob Kastenbaum and David Van Tassel. We walked around the corner to a Wendy's uh, for lunch, and we talked about publishing an edited volume to define and cover the topics of this new emerging field of humanistic gerontology. And over lunch, Bob, 
who was the most brilliant gerontologist I ever knew, sketched on a yellow napkin, he sketched out the table of contents of what became the first handbook of humanities and aging. Uh, we're now working on the fourth edition. But of course, long before the formal birth of humanistic gerontology, there were really important figures, and there still are important figures, who defy this sweeping generalization about the split between sciences and humanities, between problems and mysteries, which are always intertwined in some way or another. And Dave Eckert is the heir of this tradition, and he's passing it on to us. But I first, I want to spend some time illustrating this with some classic, a classic example, primarily Robert Butler. Robert Butler did more to change negative attitudes, develop clinical research and policy advances in aging than any other figure in the history of gerontology. He died in 2010 at the age of 83, and he's the, he's the subject of a superb biography by Andy Ackenbaum, published a couple of years ago. Butler's life and work are, are filled with not just, not just simply embellished by references to literature and philosophy and, uh, and by a lifelong commitment to a secular humanist vision in which the negative stereotypes and attitudes towards old age are challenged and replaced by positive images and formulation. In 1963, Butler named the, and developed the concept of life review, a concept that helped account for increased reminiscence in later life. At the time, reminiscence was largely considering the, considered the ramblings of garrulous old people preoccupied with the past and of no therapeutic uh, aid in lifespan development or social work or psychotherapy. But when Butler's article came out, Rose Dobroff, a social worker and a longtime director of the Brookdale Center on Aging in New York, she said, that concept changed our lives. It changed our lives. It changed our way of working with older people. And here you see the cover of Mark Kaminsky's edited volume on the uses of reminiscence. So the idea just stimulated whole new kinds of work in clinical settings and adult learning settings, as well as uh, new work in gerontological social work, often incorporating the humanities and arts and countless related programs on research and storytelling. So here we are back to, back to Butler. In 1969, Butler coined the term ageism. In 1976, he won a Pulitzer Prize for this book, Why Survive? And on the very day he received the letter awarding him the Pulitzer, Butler was appointed as the founding director of the National Institute on Aging. Throughout his varied career, Butler turned to the humanities to frame his work. He knew that fundamental questions of meaning and value and purpose lie beyond the purview of science. They are the ground on which, we uh, on which we approach the mysteries of aging. As one of the great founding gerontologists, Jim, psychologist Jim Barron put it, aging is too important to be left to the scientists. But he also said aging is too important to be left to the theologians and humanities scholars. He wanted us to walk across the bridge to each other, right? not stay separated in our walls, something we still don't do very well. So thank you, Dave, for helping us do more of this. So Butler was an early champion of humanistic gerontology, and he eased entry into the field of many of us. And through awarding Brookdale fellowships to humanities scholars, he was instrumental in establishing the careers of several important scholars. I'm just going to quickly uh, run through them now so you'll know who they are. They're, in a way, they're the humanities, humanistic legacy of Butler's generosity and Butler's vision. Many of you will know Monica Ardelt, an early, um, currently the chair of the GSA Humanities and Arts Committee and an international authority on wisdom. The key thing to, to realize about her work is that even though it's quantitative, it lives within a humanistic vision that truth resides in people, not in abstract knowledge. The moment one tries to preserve wisdom by writing it down, she says, wisdom loses its connection to a person and evaporates. Right? This is a deeply humanistic way of thinking. The truth is in the person. Right? The 
truth is not an idea. The truth is not an abstraction. The truth is not a theory. The truth exists in people who always have more meanings, who always exceed the expectations and the definitions that we try to put on them. Anne Bastings, many of you will know, career launched in many ways by um, the Brookdale Fellowship. Anne recently received a MacArthur Genius Award in part um, for developing the program Time Slips. Anne came out of a theater background, and she's best known for developing the, uh, the Time Slips. Um, Time Slips is a program f for working with uh, dementia people in group settings, which relies on their imagination rather than on their memory to make group stories. Way back in 1996, she says, I volunteered in a nursing home, the kind we all fear and yet we all seen. After many weeks of trying to engage people, I gave up on memory. One of her books is entitled Forget Memory. Cute, huh? She gave, I gave up on memory, and I invited people to imagine. Anything they offered, I would weave into a story. Songs, sounds, movements, words, facial expressions, anything they would offer, I would echo and enthusiastically weave them into a story. I've been doing it ever since, inviting, echoing, weaving, sharing, sharing with the public the miracle that is the joy and imagination of people whom the world has discarded. This is the, this is the uh, website for Time Slips. Now it's an international program. Um, I, if anybody's interested in developing uh, programs, um, for people in, in daycare centers, I strongly urge you to consider this, take a look at it. I'm working with my medical students now to develop an elective, um, a fourth year elective, in which they get trained and work with uh, dementia patients in these homes and something that we can pass on so that this elective is continually a form of education for our students. Many of you will know Kate D. Medeiros. Uh, another scholar whose career was boosted when she received a Brookdale Fellowship. Kate became interested in the notion of narrating later life when it became clear to her, as she says, that many people were interested in aging, but few were interested in aging people. She's one of the few people, if not the only person, who's trained both in medical humanities and in gerontology. Um, full disclosure, she was my student at UTMB in Galveston. Um, I think her book, Narrative Gerontology in Practice and Theory, is the founding text um, in the field. <clears throat> and many of you, of course, know Hel Helen Kivnick, clinical social psychologist, works at the University of Minnesota, long been interested in music, especially song as a form of struggle for social justice, community development, arts intervention. Her work with Eric and Joan Erickson culminated in the volume vital involvement in old age, and this work has ramified throughout her research ever since. She's long been the associate editor of the Humanities and Arts section of The Gerontologist. And here's my friend Susan McFadden. I don't know how many of you know her. <clears throat> I'm very jealous of this picture. It was taken last summer when she's on the coast um, of Maine relaxing and um, vacationing with her husband. She's been retired for several years from the University of Oshkosh, but she works almost full time developing communities, uh, community work for people with dementia. And she is the chair of the board for Ann Basting's program, Time Slips. Susan, for many years, she took the lead uh, in what I think is a tough sell in this. She took the lead on issues of spirituality and religion and bringing them into the mix of gerontological research and practice. She often quoted Jim Barron's comment about aging being too important to be left to scientists and too important to be left to humanists. And people who see aging as a problem and people who see aging as a mystery rarely acknowledge that we are citizens of both realms. Right? We live in both realms, and it's so important to walk across the borders. And finally, Ruth Ray is another key figure whose career was boosted by a Brookdale Fellowship given to her by Bob. And throughout all of these, the theme of story uh, runs as one of um, 
of Bob's interests that he finds and supports in other, uh, in other people whose careers he boosted. Um, Ruth started out um, at Wayne State um, as an English professor and a writing teacher. And this fellowship transformed her, allowed her to transform herself and to transform social gerontology. Collaborating with colleagues like Tony, uh, Tony Calasanti, she developed a powerful feminist voice in gerontology. And she wrote an amazing book. It's called End Notes, An Intimate Life, An Intimate Look at the End of Life. This book is a courageous and tender account of Ruth's physically intimate relationship with a dying man from one of her writing groups who had fallen in love with her. Just a very powerful and courageous book. So my apologies to many humanities and arts people who aren't uh, mentioned, especially our colleagues from Ireland and Austria and Britain. Um, we have you know, European contingents, which many of whom are doing the best work. Uh, in humanities and aging. So I apologize for not having the time to acknowledge them. So at the end of Why Survive, Butler turns to the question of what it means to flourish in a society characterized by ageism and inequality. This is what he writes. After one has lived a life of meaning, death may lose much of its terror. For what we fear most is not really death, but a meaningless and an absurd life. One of Butler's key themes, as I said, is story, personal and collective narratives as primary sources of meaning making. After all, that's what life review is, right? It's remaking, remeaning, and that's what reminiscences are in various group forms, forms of getting one's stories right. Or, in the case of people with dementia, sharing whatever they have um, and making those sharings part of a collective story. So stories and narratives takes many forms. Um, this is a whole field that I almost know nothing about. But I just want to note here that stories are attempts in one way or another of connecting the dots into a shape that feels meaningful into a, per into a person or a group. In narrative medicine, for example, we have a method of helping patients create new stories to construct a sense of themselves in the face of an illness that has shattered an old identity. It's as if a truck driver comes in who's lost both arms in an accident and he says, Doc, my story's broke. He will never again drive. Um, and he needs help reconstructing himself as well as reconstructing the capacity to use his hands. So I'd like to finish um, with one story from a book I've, um, I just finished. and some might see this the light of day sometime next year. I'm wrestling with my editor at Oxford about it. They just take forever. I just don't understand that. But what I'm interested in is the meanings and purposes of men in the fourth age. This is what Dave referred to. Um, of, of frailty, of uncertainty, of disease. Um, and what I did when I started to work on this book, I just decided to talk to people who were living in the fourth age. Uh, and after many fits and starts, I settled on a very highly personal and unconventional way of doing this. I just picked people I wanted to talk to, and I had conversations with them. So I apologize to the, met to the methodologists here. These are just conversations I wanted to have and stories I wanted to tell. So I ended up writing... 12 chapters about 12 highly accomplished and sometimes famous men in their 80s and 90s. And Dan Callahan is one of those men. <clears throat> I usually opened with the question, what do you do on an average day? Or how is your life now that you are old? And I followed up their answers, focusing on their actual experience of old age. I was not interested in what they had to say. Right? I was interested in what they did every day. Right? It's like you really need to know how a man spends his checkbook rather than what, what he says is meaningful to him. So the equivalent is what do you do? What's your day like? Um, and that wasn't such an easy thing with these guys who were also accomplished. It was not easy to get them to that. But four major challenges and questions came out of most of these conversations. One, am I still a man? 
Two, do I still matter? Three, what is the meaning of my life? And four, am I still loved? I must have been thinking about that last challenge when I told Def De Dave Eckert that a key purpose in living a long life was love. And I have to acknowledge here that this is as much a personal commitment of mine as it is an empirical observation. There are many kinds of love, um, but the one I want to talk about here to illustrate this story is love over a lifetime. Love which starts out as romantic love, erotic love, and remains and matures. This, such love, I think, plays a more or less salient but rarely acknowledged role in the lives of almost all these men. And this is a picture of Dan and Sidney a couple of years ago. So I want to conclude with a story about them. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, Callahan was one of the first to pose the questions, what is a long enough life? What are the purposes and meanings? In my own view, as I've said, the quality of a long but not too long life is inseparable from the quality of love and connection we have to our closest relatives, lovers, friends, and communities. This is why people spend so much time on isolation and connection. Right? This is a crucial part of the importance of well-being. But it's a truth that's unacknowledged in Dan's theory. It never plays a role in it, but it's crucial in his own life. So 30 years after first meet, my first meeting with Dan, I returned to interview him twice. In the first interview, it, it was clear to me that his personal life was entirely wrapped up with his relationship with Sidney, a writer, speaker, powerful intellectual, Catholic thinker, and conservative feminist. So I asked him, so what did you do on an average day when it wasn't about writing, it was about Sidney? So I thought that that unacknowledged love was going to be one of the keys to understanding his daily experience. So two and a half years later, I went back to talk to them together. When Dan picked me up from the train, I barely recognized him. He was gaunt. His curls had given way to stray wisps of gray. Within the last month, he's been, six months, he'd been hospitalized three times, once almost dying of appendicitis. When we got out of the car in the driveway, Dan steadied himself. Barely shuffling one foot in front of the other, he led me up the outdoor steps and in through the back door of his modest house. As we sat in the living room, their densely decorated Christmas tree huddled against the wall, working hard to convey the joy of the seasons. After lunch, Dan and Sidney sat down on the couch across from me and I set my recorder down on a table and tilted the microphone towards them. For quite a while, I listened to them talk openly about their 60 years together. And finally, I moved to the issue I wanted to pose to them. Tell me about the love you have for each other, what it means now, and what it has meant, I said. Sidney sighed. You asked the wrong people, she said, because if Dan were not here, I would give you a gushy, wonderful exposition about love. At first, Dan was mute on the topic, so I pushed him. Is there anything you want to say about your relationship and its importance for the life you live now? Sidney's eyes met mine. I don't know, Dan said. I, I can't think of much. After a long pause with his arms crossed, Dan said a bit sheepishly, I'm lucky to be married, he hesitated, to somebody so nice for so long. Sydney laughed and made kissing sounds. Wow, she said, thank you. I teased him. Say that again, I didn't hear it, I said. Sydney laughed. Don't make him say that again. Don't make him. Dan, I joked, I couldn't hear you. I don't think those words made it into the recorder. Would you say it again, I prompted him. You're lucky to be married, he smiled, to such a great person for so long. So, Dave, I guess I end up, I end up where I began. Um, and um, this is still your logo. Right? Um, and I hope um, you'll think about, in various ways, what goes in the glass. Um, and I really don't believe that more sand is the answer. I don't believe longevity itself is the answer. Um, there are many possibilities, right? 
compassion, engagement in the future, acceptance of the one and only life you have, gratitude, commitment to life beyond you, many, many things. Um, your patients, yourselves as clinicians, as policymakers. So um, I hope um, you'll think about the hourglass um, as your logo. So thanks. Thank you.